Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Stand the Test of Time with Quality Engineering. Today's event is presented by Tavant. Tavant is a digital products and solutions company that provides impactful results to its customers. Tavant continuously innovates to build intuitive products and services to aid the media giants in customer-focused campaigns and derive the best results from their technology investments. In this session, the speakers will talk about the role of quality engineering from the media industry with an example of CNBC's success with their key op strategy. Before we launch into the main presentation, I'd like to go over a few brief housekeeping items. First, today's event will be about an hour long and we will be recording it. We will email you a link to the archived recording so you can view the presentation again later if you'd like or share it with a colleague. Please disable your pop-up blockers to ensure you'll have no trouble viewing the slides for links in today's web event. This is an interactive event. Feel free to submit questions to your speakers or to our speakers using the chat box with your, on your screen. We also encourage you to tweet throughout the event using the handle at Tavon. If you would like to enlarge your slides, you may do so by dragging the corner of the box. This function allows you to make them larger or smaller. All the widgets are also resizable and movable. So feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. Please take a moment to visit our resource center. The box is on, the con is on your console. Here you can access a number of resources that you may find helpful. If you have any te technical difficulties during the webinar that I haven't covered here, Clear your cache and refresh your link to refresh your console. If that doesn't work, please feel free to reach out using our Q&A box. Finally, at the end of this event, we will present you with a survey. Please take a few minutes to fill it out and let us know your thoughts on today's event. For today's webinar, we will have two speakers. Our first speaker will be Prabhu Panchaksharam, Director of Quality Performance and Site Reliability at CNBC. He is an accomplished engineering leader with a proven ability to build high-performing distributed global teams for Fortune 10 50 companies across healthcare, media, and entertainment. He is focused on automation solutions to deliver high-quality products, leveraging CI, CD, improving the reliability of high-scale systems. Our next speaker is Chakri Devirakondo, Head of Quality Engineering at Tavon. He brings two decades of experience to quality engineering and digital assurance services. He has been instrumental in setting up quality engineering CLEs for enterprises. We'd like to warmly welcome our speakers and dive right into how quality engineering plays a critical role for the media industry. I'd like to turn it over to Chakri to get us started. Thank you, Susan. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, Prabhu. So we would uh, take you guys through um, in terms of how how the quality has been engineered in the media industry and what kind of results have we focused upon and what are the main facets and instrumental aspects of it to be successful. Uh, Prabhu would provide his experience in having this done pretty successfully at CNBC. And uh, we would also go over some of the automation components and what has been uh, doing pretty good and big and what we would see in future in terms of a uh, quality engineering standpoint. Having said that, uh, we would also like to, uh, in terms of go through a certain aspects of what is the, how do we measure success and what kind of KPIs are there and how we would be able to actually look at uh, in terms of customer experience aspect of it and how quality engineering becomes an instrumental part of it in the customer experience growth. So with that, I would uh, kick off this particular thing in terms of giving you an overview of how quality engineering has been become being a mainstream in the complete industry uh, from the media aspect of it. What kind of facets have that really uh, enabled us? And how did we 
actually mature in terms from a quality assurance to a quality engineering. So that means how well are we able to engineer quality into the whole STLC life cycle. All of us know that with the advent of Agile and DevOps and the whole uh, ecosystem from a software development life cycle, things have to be developed pretty fast, tested fast, produced, and also make sure that the customer is experiencing that aspect of it and how do we get the feedback. So the continuous loop of how all of these is being taken up. So for that, we have to do it in a very agile and uh, nimble way at the same point of time, producing and developing all of these pieces of code and making sure that they are tested, not only at the design and development part of it, but also at the customer aspects of it. So we do call it as shift left and shift right, which uh, typically talks about how do we engineer quality into the mainstream and at the same point of time measure the quality at the far end of the spectrum and what kind of feedback loop does it come into it. So when we do this kind of activities, what are the um, what are the main tenants in terms of it and how this is being helpful from a quality engineering aspect of it? The major perspective is that we need to do and automate a lot of, of these uh, features so that the testing would be faster, the feedback is easier to understand. And at the same point of time, we not only test from a functional aspect of it of those features, but also on the non-functional because that is very important for us in terms of measuring our success and performance and security part becomes a part of it. The reason for this is in the ODT world, in terms of it, there are several aspects to it. There are not only in terms of uh, typical browsers or applications, you do have connected devices, you have an ecosystem that has been built for over, over in the last few years. And that testing all of those far end of the spectrums and making sure that the user experience is part of it. And how well are we using technology to deliver this? in terms of it, not only intelligently, but at the same point of time, how well the machine language or the artificial intelligence really kicks into it and what kind of benefits are we seeing in a, from a practical standpoint? Is that what we want to discuss in terms of it? So uh, with that, in terms of when we look at it, uh, from a specific statistics in terms of how the media industry has been uh, changing and with the advent of COVID, what kind of uh, devices and how the viewership has changed. And previously it used to be only a linear kind of TV for us to uh, watch, but the streaming and the OTT devices have taken over uh, significantly in 2020 and 2021. But however, when we look at it from a statistics standpoint, linear and streaming still go hand in hand because the viewership it is being taken up in both ways. And it is not limited to any particular form of TVs, the connected devices, the mobiles, the handhelds. All of this is giving a different perspective from an engineering aspect of it on how do we test the consumer experience and what type of content is being shared to whom and how is he, they or he or she is perceiving it. So all of this is really becoming a behemoth task in terms of an engineering activity. So that's where we wanted to take a spin around in terms of what, what is being done, how are we be able to help each other in terms of getting this done? Because if you look at it from a statistics, the viewership has increased. There is significant amount of uh, streaming devices able to be available for each of the households across the globe. It's not only US or North America, it's across the globe that there has been a significant rise. In that, uh, perspective, I would like to uh, put some aspects to it and then request Prabhu in terms of what is he seeing uh, in these activities and how is that getting affected in terms of it. When you look at it, um, so there is, with all of these increased aspects in terms from a platform, devices, uh, and also the wide variety of uh, geographies that are being involved in it to test a particular content, what kind of uh, activities we have to do and how 
each of these are affecting our releases and testing activities and what kind of cost of quality we have to bring in because if you look at it cost of quality can be looked at a, a positive number or a negative number depending upon whether it is a good quality or a bad quality part of it so all these are affecting us in good positive formats and what is that could be done to increase our testing spectrum and how it is to be done that's where i wanted to bring in prabhu uh, to let us know what is he seeing from cnbc and also from the media industry part of it over to you prabhu to give you give us what start impact you are looking at it definitely thank you chakri first i want to welcome everyone for uh, joining us today so traditional media house that owns vast archives of television and movie content are targeting growth through ott based distribution model it allows us to expand into new markets optimize reach and maximize revenue in a certain way this model does not impact just content distribution alone it disrupt the entire value chain of content creation and distribution it changed how the content gets created and by whom chakri you brought up a great comparison on the linear versus streaming in the previous slide even though more tv viewers are adapting streaming services the clear majority of us households are still consuming tv programming through traditional bundle along with ott offerings with pandemic the consumers are spending more on at home entertainment a trend which is expected only to grow this current viewing habits is indicative of a great opportunity that exists in live and linear ott services in this regard look at how sports is evolving let it be nfl mls or mlb's uh, live streaming offering there is another key trend that's driving media consumption if you look at it over the years now mobile has overtaken traditional uh, media consumption so it can only further the growth of ott services and when you look at from the technology aspect of it this had been made possible by the mnos with proliferation of high bandwidth networks and advent of 5g so in my view the consumption of video would only grow i strongly believe technology advancements and consumption habits of your customers and their preference that fuels this growth so as a service provider if you are not able to give best possible customer experience there is a chance consumer will be able to find it elsewhere so we need to engineer quality into our overall product development life cycle right from design development testing and operations in my view agility and quality will be key factors to be a successful player in the media industry for a quality engineering group you need to have a plan in place for testing on various consumption platform as well as ensuring the functional performance security of your microservices that powers your product device fragmentation as chakri mentioned it just adds enormous stress on the test process and overall product delivery process for any organization of any scale think about how many number of different generation of devices or os per platform your team need to test against and the increased frequency of releases that needs to be supported without cutting corners these increases your overall quantities in traditional setup So when i look at it a strong quality engineering practice will help your organization solve this puzzle three things that will help any organization is first automation should not be an afterthought team should employ automation first approach second device lab strategy should be to promote manual and automated test for your distributed team this had become a paramount in today's world where most of our teams are remote due to the ongoing pandemic third a enablement will allow you to further bring in productivity it becomes a factor when scale of test in your organization is growing in our r we use reporting intelligence and automated exclusion of flaky test are a couple of areas where we use it effectively so chakri to you thanks prabhu so it does bring up an important point where you did mention about one of the three points is automation um, as the mainstream for the quality engineering aspect of it before i request you to deep dive into how you 
you have seen it and what are the uh, aspects in terms of it. I would like to push some questions to the audience, have some poll questions in terms of what they are perceiving and what they are seeing in terms of their organizations and industries, how automation is being utilized. So, and I'll, and I'll request the, the audience to take a look at the question, respond to it. We have around 45 seconds to one minute. We have two questions for this particular thing before we go back to Prabhu to request upon us what his perspective in terms of automation and how automation is being the mainstream for quality engineering. So the question um, is in terms of it. We would like to understand if you guys do have automation, what kind of automation it is, and how is that in terms of helping you out in the maintenance part of it? Because automation does require a lot of maintenance. So uh, we'd like to understand your perspective. I hope everyone is able to see the question and able to answer. I will take another three, four seconds to publish results. So the first poll response has come in, Prabhu, in terms of it. Significant amount of it has to have the automation, and but it requires maintenance. Uh, they end up testing manually during a test cycle. So there is an amount of manual execution. There is another question in terms of what I would like to look at it is like, while regression is being done, where do you actually identify the defects? Earlier in the life cycle, test life cycle, or later in that, far later in that, so that you would, what kind of time of, what type of time do you have and how are you resolving it? So um, we have another 45 seconds to one minute to respond to this question. Once we get the results of it, I will request Prabhu to take a perspective on from the results and also give his experience and tell us how he's been seeing automation as a mainstream. I think we would, I'm expecting this would be more towards later in the test cycle from my experience, but I will wait for the results. Oh, it's close. Um, it's it's pretty close in terms of earlier and later. So there are a good amount of engineering practices happening uh, across the board. So to your point, Prabhu, what's what what's your take on the automation part of it? No, I think it was a great question, uh, poll question, Chakri. I could definitely uh, relate to a lot of it uh, years ago, right? Um, when I look at it, without any doubt, automation must be at the top of things that you need to do, definitely, right? When you're thinking about quality engineering. And most of us, including our audience, will agree that automation brings in test efficiency. But for organizations that are looking to engineer quality, must look at it in two ways, right? One, how do you keep up with your automation soon? And second, how do you leverage automation at every step during your product development? as well as after it is deployed in production. Most teams start with a plan for their automation journey, and most of them achieve it as well, right? Does it mean that are we done? No, not even close. Automation is not an one-time activity, rather it is a continuous activity. In our arc, most of our teams follow a scrum of two or three weeks. It means our product code base is constantly changing as we build more features. We maintain our existing scripts and ensure new features are automated. So how we are able to do that efficiently is a couple of practices that I will share here. One, in-sprint automation. In-sprint automation focus allows our teams to automate new features or any modification as and when they are built. This ensures your effective test automation coverage does not go down and your automated test suite is always available for you to test your product. And the second one, another practice that we have is nightly regression runs. We run our regression scripts on a nightly basis for all our application. 
It typically happens in an integrated environment against the latest tag that's available. This allows us to effectively identify bugs as well as scripts that requires maintenance. For example, if a developer provides a tag for our team towards the end of the day, before the next morning the team comes in, the tag is already regression tested, results are available for everybody to view. This means we never lag on regression testing and our team successfully identify regression bugs as soon as we receive a tag. How this is possible? Through high test automation coverage and uh, the other key thing is scalable automation test execution infrastructure. If you would have answered yes to the poll question, I would definitely say instant automation and nightly regression can be a solution for your teams. Definitely, it helped us to move away from those challenges from uh, the past. And Chakri, you early, earlier alluded to uh, non-functional aspect of it, right? So if you look at it, performance is a critical factor in a user's experience and their vision to come back to our product and do they want to spend more time on it. Our engineers leverage functional scripts to capture certain performance measures as well, coupled with uh, APM tools like Neuralink, Datadog, et cetera. We are able to leverage these functional scripts as a synthetic monitor to measure performance of our production from different location. As you can imagine, we are a global news organization, so we would want to ensure uh, the performance is uh, at scale across the globe. And it also enables our real-time monitoring as well. So that's what my take on this one, uh, Chakri. Wonderful, Prabhu. So yeah, you, you did bring a couple of very good things in terms of how we are doing it. But when you look at it from the design objective itself and how automation has to be done, because you've touched upon in Sprint, you've touched upon um, regression automation uh, nightly builds, which is good in terms of sense of what could be done. Uh, and which is, I think, some of the one-on-ones in terms of automation to be run pretty well. And at the same point of time, you also touched the non-functional part of it, using the functional scripts, mm -hmm. not only in the synthetic you know, shift left aspect of it, but also on the real-time monitoring. But for us to achieve all of these in terms of, from an automation standpoint, I would like you to provide an insight in how these design objectives, what are the design objectives that have been really helpful? And what are the major design objectives which really pivoted in terms of getting this automation framework selection done? I think it's a good segue. Uh, I think we can't uh, emphasize more on the importance of the design aspect when it comes to framework, Chakri. So, Automation frameworks are essential part of any successful automated testing process, right? So one of the most important thing that we are trying to achieve by automation, if in my view, it's to infuse speed into the delivery process. So our framework design should ensure parallel and multi-thread execution capability, as it will allow you to scale your execution. See, one thing in our experience is to look out for test data dependency, right? If not handled properly, it can totally derail your ability to run uh, tests in parallel. And I think, and probably I'm gonna state the obvious, framework should be platform agnostic and extensible as it provides flexibility and allows your engineers to extend any library features to their needs. And when you're looking at um, how you want it to design, you typically don't want to design your framework that is restrictive, right? Especially it is better to support execution both on real devices and simulator. What it can do is it empowers the team to decide whether they to execute on a device or a simulator during runtime based on factors like is there availability of device or not, right? And when we are looking at continuous testing I would say, I will go ahead and say like, uh, uh, without it, it's CICD is at best at build automation, right? So it is imperative for you to ensure that your framework is able to plug and play with any of the build or CI solution that can be available for you and your organization. More from OTT space that we talked about, right? Like network proxy capabilities is gonna be a very important factor. It allows you to validate uh, a uh, lot of network related validation. And one example I can think of is your analytics call. 
like for media organization, you have comp scores and uh, I'm not sure of anything. And one key thing is it takes an enormous amount of uh, manual test effort. So I think it's a very good feature to have part of your uh, framework. It also provides, you can bring an intelligence to your test, right? So think about just reporting a test case failed versus capturing your network details, attaching with your test failed result. I think that will be very much a valuable information for your uh, developers who are to debug and fix the issue. It just makes this process much more efficient and faster. Next one, uh, I'd say like it's critical part of your design most time teams overlook that is reporting. I think if your reports are not actionable, then you're going to spend endless hours trying to make head or tail out of execution reports. Now, imagine if your organization executes tens of thousands of tests each day, it can quickly become chaotic and inefficient. Reports should capture all the required data points on failure. For example, like you can think about screenshots, system resource status, network call, et cetera. It is valuable for teams to push results at a test execution level, at a test level, rather than at a test run level, if you ask me, as it will enable real-time status monitoring as well. So you can, what we have done is we have built intelligence with this setup. Let's say our team starts a test run of 500 test cases and assume that every test starts failing because the service was not deployed correctly. And in a scenario, you think if you are pushing your results after test run, not after each test, you end up waiting for 500 tests to fail and then realize, okay, something went wrong. So you have to rectify and rerun. Oftentimes in our business where we have to be very nimble in terms of like the releases, it can be very costly. Instead, if you're pushing your results after each test, and then we have an intelligence built into our system where based on a threshold, it will automatically understand that, hey, there is something else going on, which is not related to uh, actual test failure. So based on the threshold, it will automatically abort the test. So this brings a great value to our teams. And in my experience, what I've seen is organizations with mature QV process lean towards pushing the results after each test versus pushing them uh, after a run, if that makes sense to you, uh, Chopri. Yeah, that, that's pretty good because you, you have taken up few points which are typical across an automation framework design objective, irrespective of the industry, what we do serve. And there are few aspects where you have brought it up in terms of specific to the OTT and the media industry is the network proxy capabilities, capability to test on devices as well as simulators, part of it, and also an independent and extensible um, platform because definitely given the advent that you do have multi multitude of different devices, uh, uh, whether it is a Roku, Apple, or uh, even the smart TVs, how how well can we be able to connect all of these in this large enterprise ecosystem and run through these tests? And you did also mention about one specific aspect which every organization has to look at it as that, what is that intelligence we can feed into the automation, not only typically running those and executing it, but the ability to catch those defects earlier in the life cycle, take some actions over it, and then rerun through it. So that way you're reducing the time. And the most important part of it, automation has to be a return on investment previously, but nowadays the automation is to time to market. How well can I reduce the time to market part of it? So that's, that's, that's wonderful in terms of what you have summarized. Moving to the next part of it, which is the features of the framework. You did mention about what are the objectives in which where, how the framework has to be designed, which set the tone for all of us. But what do you think the features? I know there would be some amount of uh, similarities from the objectives to the features aspect of it and some kind of uh, uh, combination of it. But from a media and an OTT space, what do you feel, what would be the features that would be really essential, quintessential for us to design a very strong um, automation framework. Definitely. Um, I think similar to what we discussed earlier, right? I think there's going to be a lot of the, the features available here. It's going to be very specific to media industry, but a lot of it's going to be common as well. So if I look at from that perspective, uh, if you're in a leadership position, think of it you need to have a unified tech stack because it's the best practice because you don't want to stretch yourself across different tech stack 
which can lead to a bloated team size or a license cost in turn uh, overall uh, increased cost so what i would recommend is our thought should be are we able to accomplish our automation objective with minimal spread right in our case most part of what we do is in java we do use python and javascript in certain areas if, if you ask about that and um in terms of devices i would definitely say like we prefer to use uh, physical devices uh, as far as uh, our execution uh, preference goes and we talked a little bit about uh, analytics that's also very much specific to media industry and it's also in a certain way these days with performance measures with uh, google core web vitals and i think it's it's important for you to have that feature but one key thing that definitely stands out from media standpoint i would say is like how are you going to ensure your streaming qos right the quality of service is crucial for traffic heavy content especially live streaming so a poor qos can greatly impact your customer's experience on the stream let it be an image quality or buffering etc right even though we have passive in player monitoring the streaming qos validation part of our framework enables us to do active monitoring so what i mean by that is essentially we create a continuous simulation of a content in a specific location so that it can be tested 24 by 7 the sequence of player would go through during this video playback be recorded and then be executed repeatedly allowing the data to be collected centrally for processing so why right if you ask if you think about it with active monitoring end user don't have to be viewing your content for issues to be detected as a result problems can be seen early and fixed before they have a lasting impact on your customer's quality of experience so in my view the best approach in fact is to deploy both as you look at these two approaches they complement each other rather than competing against each other see providing consistent quality in streaming video experience is the way to keep your customers to stay on your platform i think there is no second <laughs> thought to it and a couple of other points that i will pick up on this one i would say is like the time series uh, uh, report it definitely it's very useful um because if you are having a trend uh, report of your results of your test case execution by uh, configuration and so forth let's say you ran a test on firefox chrome and safari and it started failing only on safari this will allow you to go back and pinpoint in which exact tag it started to fail again we talked about the uh, uh, the performance aspect of it as a tester most of us can uh, relate to it is your environment being up and running and your ability to have a uh, stable environment is key for your productivity or in your team's productivity uh, when i look at it so capturing single user performance part of your functional test is invaluable to that aspect as it allows you to keep track of your environment and uh, application performance what you can do is you can build intelligence on top of these data and you can create alerts based on the thresholds or percentage changes so i would summarize with that uh, chakri in terms of like what are the key things when you are looking through the lens of a uh, media industry which features uh, makes most sense thanks prabhu so you brought a couple of good points in terms of in addition to the emulators and part of it where the analytics validation the streaming queue as validation which becomes of paramount importance uh, uh, primarily for the fact that there is a lot of lot of moving parts that needs to be synchronized versus in terms of video audio and also the um uh transcripts so that way we understand what's what's the player is being able to do and how the uh, performance is being affected to the end user and you also brought up a very good point in terms of how the time series reports and the performance of it can be uh, merged and looked at it from a single point of view from an automation standpoint rather than uh a lot of organizations or the industry shouldn't look that performance is something different than the uh, typical automation part of it having said that dan before i move on to the uh, part of what are the test automation components how how did the journey of it and what kind of aspects are you being testing in cnbc uh, i would like to throw some poll questions we do have two, two poll questions in terms of it uh, for the audience to look at 
what do they do use currently from an automation solution? Is it an open source solution? Is it a commercial tool or it's a combination of it given the fact that we are talking about multitudes of technologies and uh, tool stacks? Um, so I would like the audience to take a look at this question and in terms of provide their response on what they are looking at, what they are looking at. Before Prabhu talks about how in CNBC, this particular problem of multitude of devices and technologies uh, situation from an automation standpoint has been attacked. Um, we have around one minute as usual, 45 seconds to one minute. So I would be giving around another 15 to 20 seconds for the audience to provide their responses. Quite, quite briefly there, we come from a time where there used to be no open source automation tools. So. <laughs> right. Couple of more seconds. And looks like we have a kind of a combination of it. That's a, that's a good sign, I think, Prabhu, in terms of how uh, our audience are looking at it where there is a significant amount of, given the fact that the technology stack itself is too different and too vast. And second question, which comes out in terms of uh, the bigger part of the problem when we see it is in the OTT space is that, what is the automation infrastructure to test these multitude of different devices, whether it is mobile and web, we do have good amount of cloud device farm solutions across uh, the industry, but however, from an OTT space, there is a limited amount of uh, ability to do it. So wanted to understand uh, from the audience on what is their current automation infrastructure and how are they utilizing it? So that uh, we can go back to your um, perspective of how CNBC was able to um, attack this particular problem. Definitely. Now the previous poll result was so eye opening. I saw zero percent on commercial only, so that's interesting. <laughs> uh, that, that's a that's a good amount of advancement in the technology side of it. Uh, Seven to eight years back, we have been in the in in the different world. Definitely. So we do have the results. It's it's interesting. Um, all of them have selected. A both that means there is a certain amount of uh, inputs in terms of what it is. So going back to our discussion in terms of it, uh, I know that CNBC has a very um, futuristic engineering ecosystem and there are so many different components to it. I want you to take some time, explain our audience and how this framework with all the features and the objectives that have come into play, how it has been developed and how it is being utilized. Um, I know it would be a little bit of a monologue for them, but this is the meat of it where I would like you to put some uh, thoughts into the into us. No, definitely. I Again, uh, great poll questions, uh, Chapri. In, in a certain way, right, it's eye-opening, especially the second one. As you can see, no organization can go and say, like, hey, there is one solution for uh, everything. I think that's that's quite telling. So see, when we started our journey, when we wanted to choose a solution that will meet our needs, so we also, like everybody else, started analyzing uh, commercial as well as uh, open source solution. So even when we chose multiple commercial solution together, it was not addressing on what we need to accomplish. So, and also it came at an additional cost, right? So when we look at it, there is no one solution that could be used to support our portfolio of application, because we have a quite a bit of an, uh, a stack at a cross platform, let it be on API web, mobile apps, OTT, in some cases are uh, on a real time graphics as well. And recently uh, with so many uh, streaming services, we are putting it on smart TVs, right? So instead what we did was similar to, I think most of our audience have done that, right? We were able to put together some of the custom frameworks on top of the open source solutions that uh, met our needs. This way we were able to accomplish our needs without taking on additional costs. It also gave us the flexibility to extend the features. So 
in our world, we kind of divided um, our applications into four distinct areas and the frameworks to uh, service all these four different areas. That would be API, web, mobile apps, and OTT. So let's talk a little bit about each one of them, right? So when I'm looking at our API framework, it's a rest assured API framework. It is a Java-based library that is used to uh, test our RESTful web services. This library, it behaves like an headless client to access our REST web services. What we have done is we can create a highly customizable HTTP request to send it over to the RESTful server. So you can look at it like, why not a generic REST assured web service test automation framework? Typically what we have seen is it's very verbose and does not help us in writing and concise and uh, easily readable test. So conventionally an easy to read test in my view can have multiple steps where each step should be in an object and an action format where the object represents your logical service and application and the test and the action represents the uh, the API endpoint. So in our framework, it abstracts the implementation of the service call, retry logic, error handling, and response. So parsing behind this easy to use method allows our QE team to compose precise and easy to maintain test scripts. As we talked a little bit earlier, right, we, we also capture a lot of performance metrics, especially on our API um, framework. What it does is, it allows us to kind of like gather some of these uh, invaluable information as and when we are running our uh, regression suit. And speaking of regression suit, most of our API regression suit can be completed in a matter of a couple of minutes. Uh, the way we have set up our test execution infrastructure is phenomenal where our teams can get through the entire regression in space of like a minute or two, which is very helpful to uh, infuse that uh, speed and give faster feedback to our development. When you're looking at, moving on to the next one, uh, the web automation framework, uh, I think most of our audience might be quite familiar. We use a page object design pattern there. So what it means is each class represents each page of an application. And sometimes it can also represent a component or a template within the page based on how you are uh, approaching it. And as we all know, there are various benefits when we are using a POM model, right? code readability, usability, and maintainability. This framework would be easy to roll out for any web application, and it's easy to root. And also, you can extend uh, the capabilities in this framework. Our mobile apps, I would say, like, it's pretty much similar. This also uses the POM, and, uh, but we do use our uh, APM-based tests for them. In our framework, we have three different uh, modules where we have uh, specific utility classes, service manager and common utility classes. And the key thing I would highlight on that is we have it uh, integrated with our custom device lab and on-prem setup uh, as well as with uh, cloud. It gives us a tremendous scale. So moving on to the last one, OTT by far as we, for now, I think uh, we all can agree that it's the most fragmented. So our framework handles all the complexities of actually interacting with the devices across platforms. It contains different set of drivers to interface with uh, Roku TV, Apple TV, Fire, or Android TV. Um, we also use Telnet and uh, ADB Debug Console for monitoring the app as well as the player. So one other thing that we talked about uh, is the analytics. So we do use our browse, uh, browser or proxy library to intercept the analytical call, and uh, uh, we use that for uh, part of our framework for OTT validation. That kind of like it should cover what we had for the, our frameworks, uh, Chakri. That's wonderful because if you look at it, you start you started it at the API part of it, which is the key aspect of it for in terms of it, and the web and the mobile web and mobile apps are something which most of the organizations have been familiar, and there is a cloud device management solutions to it. But the key component, what you've touched base in terms of the OTT device and the automation framework, able to orchestrate all of these layers is actually a revealing part of it because that's where most of the meat of the work in terms of testing would happen. So we're glad that all of these are falling in place. Which also brings us to the point, uh, Prabhu, is that for you to manage all of these different facets and kind of um, teams, 
such a large scale of it. How how do you think in terms of or what has been the mantra in terms of the delivery model, which was really successful, and how how was it, how were the teams defined, and uh, what kind of delivery aspect have we touched upon? So that we. Uh, not only from a technical standpoint, from also from a managerial standpoint and management standpoint, what could be the effective way to make this happen? Definitely. See, when when you are looking at the key drivers for our team, there are three. One, like best possible customer experience, product quality, and the third one is product delivery speed. Years ago, when we started looking at it, uh, we were traditional QA, but we eventually transformed our teams from traditional QA to QE, and we also rolled out uh, CI/CD pipelines for our delivery process. Our team started learning ways to engineer quality into our products as we started embracing agile and DevOps practices. And attention to the quality is typically not paid towards uh, uh, the end of the software development lifecycle, but more during the conceptualization and uh, development. This had tremendous impact on the product delivery speed and quality. Now, when you look at our operation team, they support both internal and external customers. With such improvements in the product delivery speed, now we are releasing on a daily basis, in fact, multiple times uh, in some cases. So which means this increased release frequency presents a unique challenge for our operation team. How to keep yourself updated with features and platform changes so that they can better serve our customers. Another challenge we face at this point of time, the agile teams were throwing features over the wall to the apps when it got deployed to production. Obviously, these two factors combined did not help our team to deliver best possible customer experience. So I would say like our quest to provide the best possible customer experience is the reason why we embarked upon the QE apps model. Quality engineering, if you look at it, we have structured into COE team and agile QE. Let's look at how our COE team kind of uh, is set up. The primary focus for them is on enablement of our Agile QE. They are the go-to people when it comes to our automation framework, tools, and test execution infrastructure. They define overall quality process and standards and best practices. They maintain the metrics as well as dashboards for QE to make informed decisions. They collaborate with our DevOps and the CI/CD process, pipeline integration, and et cetera. They collaborate with our ops team to enable the continuous functional monitoring in production as well. So now you look at our agile QE. They primarily take the defined process from the COE and they implement these defined process and continuously improve them. Ultimately, they own the end-to-end -end test strategy, planning, and execution of for our portfolio of application and platforms. They also develop and maintain automation script. They started managing test environment. Uh, they do deployment, performance, security testing, among many other things. Ultimately, this group has the end-to-end -end ownership of overall QE deliverables. So in my view, ultimately, if you look at it, quality engineers, nothing but he's, he or she is an expert who understands software testing as well as everything else that goes into producing and delivering quality software. Our QEs are embedded within Agile teams and work closely with our operation teams as well as to, um, to engineer quality, right, at every stage of our product life cycle. In a typical scenario, after we deploy to production, the QE apps will monitor, observe, and analyze the logs and validate in production. We heavily use A-B testing feature flags during this phase until the features are working correctly in production. Based on these learnings and customer feedback, teams shape up the subsequent product feature changes. So ultimately this model streamlined the knowledge gaps for our support team as they collaborate with the QE on an ongoing basis and customer feedback is taken in the right way and worked upon. If you look at it, ultimately it's customers who assess the product quality, usability and performance, right? So we have a feedback mechanism set up by our customer care channel to understand the issues faced by our end users, and we strive to remedy them at the earliest. So in that view, QE plays a major part while building the product, as well as when we are learning about our products and customer behaviors in production. I would call it, it's an infinite loop, right, with continuous testing at its core. So look out for opportunities to integrate automated validation into every development and operational activity your team performs. 
So I would say like that kind of work our uh, uh, mantra behind uh, the QE DevOps model, uh, Chakri. Wonderful, Prabhu. So you you brought up two different aspects to it. One in terms of setting up a center of excellence to drive what is important and needed at an enterprise level, because there are so many aspects to it. And the second perspective, what you've brought on into this is that it's a continuous delivery model, continuous testing model. So we are using the DevOps, the Nirvana of DevOps cycle in terms of making sure that everything is being tested and the feedback loop is being consumed by the QE itself so that you do not have one specific production support kind of a model, which would really reduce the time to learn and time to take a feedback. With, with all of this in terms of it, um, though it's kind of academic in terms of it, how do you measure the success in the customer standpoint? The delivery attributes you you brought in in terms of what are the delivery attributes in terms of it, where it is availability, efficiency, scalability, part of it. And the most important, how responsive and how, what is the resiliency in aspect of it. So that also brings in terms of futuristic perspectives and how we can utilize chaos engineering kind of a proactive models rather than being reactive and testing it. In it. So that means you're doing a lot of activity more in the production part of it and experiencing the customer um, impact, uh, customer experience impact, and what are those success values. But all of this is sometimes when you look at it from the uh, aspect of it, it is academic and uh, um, very textbook, if I have to put it that way. But from, from your experience standpoint, what you have seen, what are those top two to three uh, KPIs, which you feel that that is actually driving the success for the QE of delivery model. Definitely. Um, say, if you look at it, right, it's good to stay on top of these uh, operational metrics that affect your customers. But just keep in mind that you also need to uh, really listen to your customers and understand how they actually experience it. So in my view, it's crucial to understand how these experiences impact your customer's behavior, which in turn impacts your business. To understand this better, I would say like we need to look at our churn, retention, time spent on any kind of uh, engagement measure. If I'm looking at time spent on your product by your customer, it's very much indicative of their loyalty, right? Let's say if one of your options, operational metric, for example, availability or responsiveness is bad, you will see an immediate impact on the time spent by your customer on your product. So. If I must tie it down to one measure that brings our operational effectiveness and customer experience together, it will be time spent by uh, our customers on our product. That's wonderful. You've, you've tied the business objective to the technology objectives. So typically the business outcome is affected by the technology outcomes. So that way you're saying that the time spent by the product or by the customer on the product is directly impacting to the delivery attributes what it is. Wonderful, uh, Prabhu, that's, that's really great. So um, you've, you've taken us through the journey in terms of it, you've, you've given us certain aspects of it. Uh, I would like to, in terms of, uh, since we do have few minutes, uh, the journey part of it, I would like to summarize for the audience and then take your viewpoint and then go for the question and answer. Uh, let me spend a minute in terms of it on the operations journey. You did mention about that, there's a transformation that definitely needed from a QA to QE. So that means you're engineering quality into it rather than assuring quality what has been developed already. So that means it's primarily and predominantly um, engineering activity rather than a typical assurance or a verification or a validation activity part of it. You also have summarized that in terms of making all of this happen into a QA to QE journey, automation is one of the key facets to it and how automation has become the mainstream in the engineering quality, both from a functional and a non-functional aspect. That also coupled with how all of the CI, CD or the DevOps models that needs to be integrated so that we, we are using all these futuristic models in terms of experiencing it, putting aspects into the quality uh, in that, and then you also mentioned about and how to set up this from a governance model. So a QE governance, which is a QE center of excellence, making sure that there is an agile team and there is a feedback loop and 
also have fail fast and fail early aspect of it. So this this brings us to the perspective that what's what's your final thought to it in terms of it before I open up and ask the audience for a QA. and a uh, last 30, 40 seconds of your uh, perspective. Sure. See, if I look at it, right, we, we talked a lot of these uh, together uh, uh, for the last hour. For any transformation journey, you wanted to break it down uh, to three categories, right? People, process, and tool. When we are looking at people, you can further break it down, at least from our like engineering standpoint, technical skill set, culture, capacity, and morale. Without technical skill set, there is no way you can implement automation. So have a plan to upskill your existing team and also make sure you change your hiring plan to adapt to the new reality by hiring the technical resource for any of your uh, new or open question. Over time, I would say like you should be able to transform your team skill profile. And when it comes to culture, unlearning the traditional practices to learn the modern practice is the first step. Teams can be skeptical about any change, right? So as it impacts their day-to-day -day activity. So as a leader, it is important to provide consistent messaging to individual teams, organization, and even your leadership that automation is an enabler, not a replacement of your team. Capacity-wise, I'd say like most teams, they do overlook it. So if your teams are always on project deliverable without school of time uh, to invest in QA process and uh, tools, then I think it, you might as well start investing there and steer them for continuous focus on automation. All these transformations that we have done over the years, I've always felt that is a very good motivator and improves your team morale rather than them always feeling like, oh, am I going to be perceived as a bottleneck to faster and uh, quality releases, right? That means like not just people. If you have, let's say, there is a lack of tool or standardized process, that also limits your uh, ability. So I would say like the teams should define that and integrate uh, with your agile development process, bring in the right tools, make sure it, it is the right tool for your organization, right? I think that is very important. And define the metrics and enable automated data capture when it comes to your governance. That will be a huge boon because automated governance kind of reduces the overhead on your team. That really propels them. I quickly summarize how our teams used to look like and then where we are today. At the start of the journey, most of them were doing just manual functional or regression testing. If I look at it today, our team kind of like participates in RFP process to engineer quality during design. They make sure the applications are built with uh, automation capabilities. Proper logging is there for enabling monitoring in production. And we also do go through uh, failure mode effect analysis as the new systems are built. And there is a bunch of technical skills that the team has added and responsibilities over the years. And at end, we do have a very highly motivated team. What I would want to do is like, before we wrap this up, right? I just wanted to say like, you can be successful in this journey at your organization as well. But I can't emphasize more on the importance of people and their transformation for any of it to be successful, even though this is a technology transformation we are talking about. But choosing right tools, process that fits your organization, scalable test execution infrastructure, and automated governance process that truly enables your team to make the right decision are equally important. As we part, I just wanted to wrap it up with one key stat. Our applications have very good automation coverage. The teams fully leverage our execution capabilities. It is quite evident from the 1.5 million plus automated tests the team has executed here today. With that, we hope we were able to inspire today's audience about quality, automation, and customer experience. Uh, thank you from my side. <laughs> Chakri? Thanks, Prabhu. Um, since we have a minute or two, I will leave it to Susan for the Q&A. Um, yeah, that was a wonderful overview. I'm sure the audience learned so much. Thank you. Um, so we probably have enough time for like one question. Um, we have about a minute left. Um, so, you know, what is the main problem you're trying to solve at the moment? Um, Jackie, I don't know if you want to go ahead and take that one. So, yeah, um, the main problem, what we're trying to solve is that with the vast technology and different types of uh, tools we in place, what is the strategy in terms of 
testing it, how are we be able to successful in terms of testing that, and what kind of important features and objectives that are needed that needs to be run through it. And as Prabhu did mention about culture of the organization and the upscaling of the associates, that is very much required. Uh, for us to be successful, and that's the major challenge in terms of it when we look at it from an industry standpoint. Yeah, so I'll keep it very brief, right? Like, if if I'm looking at it, keeping in theme of uh, what we had been discussing, I'd say smart TV automation and uh, creating a lab for uh, smart TV uh, devices. I think it's something that uh, I'm constantly thinking about and planning to solve that. Uh, as most of you are aware, with an HDMI out device like any of the OTT devices, it's much easier to build a lab and scale. With uh, smart TVs, where you have only HDMI so input, so which is a challenge that I'm trying to uh, uh, explore and solve at this point of time. Great, thank you so much for all of your contribution today, and I want to say thank you to the audience for their interest and attention. Um, I'd also like to just reiterate one more time a big thank you to Prabhu and Chekri. Um, and finally, a special thank you to Tavant for making today's event possible. This concludes today's webinar. I hope you all have a wonderful day.